The Leggett Podcast is sponsored by Montrex. Montrex is a cutting-edge sportswear brand empowering athletes across the world, built to enhance performance and give you confidence to go the extra mile. They've got some of the most incredible products at montrex.com. There is a link below this video. Click the link and at checkout, enter the code LEGIT for 15% off your order. That's L-E-G-I-T, all one word. Everything from jackets, cargo pants, gym tops, t-shirts, uh, running jackets, running pants. Everything is on their website and they sponsor some of the most incredible athletes. Everything from UFC fighter Leon Edwards and a good friend of the podcast, uh, boxer Jazza Dickens. So click the link below, use the code LEGIT at checkout for 15% off your order. Welcome to the Legger Podcast. It's me, Jordan Neal. It's me, Andy Grant. And this week's guest is the return of Rob Pope. <laughs> Hattrick ball. <laughs> your story, Rob, was that good the first time we got you on the Legger Podcast live? Yeah, what and now you, that was, man. I know, and now you're back Reality in again. Returned, yeah. Boss. Before we uh, jump in, massive shout out to Montrex. They're our sponsors. You get 15% off if you if you type in Legger at checkout. I'm actually, Mont, I'm going to keep Very this dapper. on. It's good stuff, you know. Yeah, no, it looks it, man. I'm thinking, stuff. aye, aye. And, um, <laughs> they're doing junior gear at the moment as well. They've got new caps out. Um, so, yeah, check them out. Give them a follow on Instagram and use Leggy for 15% off. Right, back to the man, the myth, the legend, Rob Pope. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly the myth. I was, <laughs> I was so happy, mate, when we done the first one because I knew, you know, we'd be seeing you again. Obviously, we did at the live and again this one. Big one for this one is the book is out. But, well, it's out on Thursday. So you'll be listening to this Monday morning. Rob Pope's book, Becoming Forest, is out on Thursday. So make a mental note in your diary for it. Um, yeah. And you've brought me in a copy, exactly. which I'm super yeah. excited yeah, I'm for. I'm so excited for this week. And I'll, I'll, Jordan I'll only I'll loves the podcast because he gets, he gets the odd bit of free. <laughs> That's all I'm here for, like fame, yeah. whatever the other people are in it for. I just want free gear. <laughs> that, man, yeah. So, mate, I'm, I'm, yeah, cannot wait to start reading this, Becoming Forest, out on Thursday. So... You've got a few other challenges, mate, we're going to talk on, but if we can start on the book, if that's all right with you. Yeah, of course. When was it then, kind of, the point where you started putting a pen on a bit of paper and to the point where you were like, no, I'm happy with it? Yeah. <laughs> well, you have to ask me about when I'm happy with it in a few years' time. <laughs> I um, because just like, you know, with the run I was doing it for sort of charity and I wanted everybody to follow along and stuff like that, so I started a blog um when i was actually doing it and so uh, i was supported by my now wife nadine and we had a camper and we were going across at the end of the day after we'd had whatever we'd rustled up in the uh, in the microwave and, and the little gas stove we had uh, i'd just write down sort of my thoughts for the day and stuff like that and you know every three days or so i'd have like a decent little body of text and that's actually still all on the um on my website uh, mm. which is going the distance run.com you know and so um but it was it was really hard and you find when you're trying to do it day after day because like sort of you know as anyone who's creative and i'm not creative would know you go through bits where either you've got nothing to say or you don't want to say it you know you've got all these things you're just like i'm tired i don't want to <laughs> put it down on paper but yeah they got it down and then eventually just because like we ran out of money on the trip and i had to go solo pushing me pram i didn't have a laptop anymore so in me sort of like phone i would write things like sort of and andy jord leg it uh you know take a photo of the outside place and then afterwards i'd be like who's this andy fella <laughs> and then about to see the photo go oh god that's a podcast yeah and then sort of you know you put everything together like a spider's web of memories and stuff and then that went like directly from there into like you know prose I guess like but uh, obviously I'm not an author I did meet GCSE and stuff but you know sort of uh, uh, I've never like sort of put anything significant down like that and um, that was only after I tried to convert the blog writing to a book because you're writing completely a different way you know mm. sort of you know you, there's a lot more well George a writer aren't you, mm. you, you... Yeah, I was going to say like the, the writer's block you were having then I was just yeah. thinking yeah my life <laughs> <laughs> do you blog at all? Yeah, well, I used to, yeah. yeah. Not so much anymore because obviously just sort of business, uh, business and, busy and exactly. busyness. But yeah, it's a, it's a way to get your thoughts out. But days you have where you're just rolling and you're rolling, there's paragraph after paragraph, and then there's days you go, yeah. today, 
dot 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 it's a really true thing but I'm so interested obviously to see the book and like I say this to people all the time like what you can put out on a page is sometimes very different to what you think it is in your head and then you start to write and you start yeah. to get your thoughts down and it just runs away with you and you know yourself like the, like, the way you write a blog mm. it's just completely different to the yeah. sort of thing you know if, if you like sort of read a blog in a book unless it's like separate chapters like Dave Grohl's one and stuff yeah. like that I think you'd be a bit disappointed because yeah, yeah. there's no mm. there's no real connection to it mm. you know and of course you only realise at the very end of a story hang on that little bit ties in really well yeah. with this yeah. bit here so then you have to and I think that's what the really talented writers do mm. like so they're not saying that I am people who be the judge <laughs> yeah. in that but, um <laughs> I think they put things through and they you know they'll start rooting for someone early on and they hope that they come good yeah. you know and yeah you know what and um phil reed he's i mean a great he's a great uh journalist well he's not a journalist if you like but he got a journalism degree works on documentaries and all kinds now and he had to go with my book and that's just what you're saying that then completely brought me back the my book ends with uh, my daughter looking at my leg at the tattoo of a you'll never walk <laughs> yeah. and that obviously comes in the middle of the book and i think yeah his idea to oh it'll be good to end with the mm. bringing it back and obviously I guess if you're just writing blog things yeah they're not all gonna come back on each other are they you need a good writer to be able to go actually that links well to that that links like to that and people bring think it all together. people think structure's the main thing they're like you know I need to go like say uh, begin and middle end and like I need to do it that way but what usually happens is you'll write something and then you know like it'll all sort of look like a mess and then you just tie the Jenga pieces in do you know what I mean and suddenly you've got yeah. an actual flowing mm. story or a flowing yeah. piece of work but yeah, it's, it's always good to like, you know, that's why most people's like success are usually just blurbs what they've wrote down. You know, just like scribbles, but then yeah. you realise actually that's a that's a piece of genius that I wrote like on the back of a Mac. Songwriters as well, yeah. like, to, like, uh, like Tom out of radio, it basically just has loads of random words and he just mm. like just goes that, 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 that's what a load of radio lyrics like, <laughs> yeah. like, oh, bollocks, but, you know, so they, uh, but they do work because yeah. he's a genius, you know, mm. and so... Was it like the tough the editing process and you know, all before on air we started speaking? I mean, you've been on. I mean, it says it on the on the title: fifteen thousand six hundred and twenty-one miles in four hundred and twenty-two days, two boxes of chocolates. <laughs> um, I mean, you could probably write ten books on yeah. the little things that happened. I mean, how difficult was it to kind of pick and choose what you wanted to put in? I mean, from the last podcast, the amount of people who you're like a bit of a favourite for them and oh. say, "Oh, I could listen to him all day," and you know, I'll write, ask him this next time and. Obviously, you could. But how did you pick and choose what's going in the book? Yeah, it is mad. Like I, I wrote what I thought was a fairly edited version as it was because you know we all remember when we were taught about writing in school and stuff like that. They say you got to describe the environment, you know, and we'll all be here just going to go like as my feet sort of splash through the mud and sort of you know mm. the rain clouds were threatening and foreboding. <laughs> But if you did that all the time, people would just go, oh my God, I didn't want a weather forecast. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted this and so. On, on that note, sorry, wrote to put in, I know, I know it's about your book, but on that note, I need to tell you this. So, <laughs> my dad, he's saying before, he's very old school. When Phil done my book, Phil was doing, like, using a lot of, like, you know, adjectives and stuff like that. You know, Scout's dad from Bootle reads, it was like, how the fuck's he describing every word like that? <laughs> <laughs> like every word is that and then like Phil took it on board and changed it but yeah. it's exactly what you're saying isn't it you can go maybe too far or not enough mm. and yeah. it's getting the balance exactly and you had to like sort of make sure that people knew that you were in Kansas and not in LA as well you know see every now and again you'd splash that in I was quite lucky that um it was almost a bit like a spoon feeding process for me because I had natural chapters in the states and even though, like we'd say before, about you know, you put all these things together, and you got to link them. I did try and make each chapter almost a little bit like a short story, mm. so you could pick it up. And there's enough chapters, like you know, sort of. Uh, but the original edited version was about three hundred and fifty thousand words long, and when you consider the average sort of book is about seventy to hundred. Yeah, you know, it could, it could it could have been five books, and so uh, I'm hoping if this does really well, that one day, like sort of, uh, like publishers happen, author would be interested in releasing the, the uh, Blades on a director's cut, you know. <laughs> yeah. And um, the initial editing process was taking it down from that three hundred and fifty thousand because I had no interest from publishers whatsoever. Like, let's just say if I was, I don't know, Mo Farah, you know, and Mo, Mo turns up at like Harper Collins and says, hey. I've got these five books. They would just be like, so we've got a very nice chair and a pen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, do you yeah, want to yeah. come over here? But of course, nobody 
apart from like sort of, you know, my family and my mates are going to buy five books by me. In fact, even most of my mates would say, oh, mate, no, which one's the best? <laughs> I've done four. <laughs> yeah, which yeah. one's the best? <laughs> and um, so I had to get it down to a bit and I got an editor, a chap called James Millington. Uh, I don't know what, if he knew what he was getting in for. Like, and I just said, can you edit this down? And he sent me like sort of, you know, his, um, his fees per 100 words of stuff very reasonable like but I don't think he was anticipating the payday that he got you know? <laughs> and uh, he was just like wow that's a that's a lot and um, he got it down probably to about 180,000 and I was just like you've got rid of this story no that's that's massive that's going in you know and sort of in, he kept doing he said you know you did sort of get me to edit this down you know mm. so he didn't add anything like sort of a, you know uh, he put a couple of nice touches in, like sort of uh, little head notes to the chapters and stuff, and that's been carried on by the final editor, who got it down to a more manageable and the thing you see in front of you, which is hundred and twenty thousand, and still big. But I'm all about value for money. That's <laughs> yeah, what it is, you know? <laughs> Going back to podcast, give you a big, big book, you know. <laughs> and um, like I've done, I've done the audio book for it as well. So I've literally not just read it; like I've read the thing, including the monster, about sort of you know five or six times. And um, there's two people, including a, a lady called Chris Baker, who does the Croxteth Hall Park Run, uh, who've read the monster. Then they read the two book version, which is the the one that James did, and now they've read this. And the one thing that they've said, you know, going back to sort of what you said about Phil and sort of your own book there is all the way along they said that the editors have maintained my voice and they've not changed it you can't mm. you know it's not as if you're just like oh man this second editor's just tried to write his own book and so the skill mm. involved yeah. in that and like sort of not sort of just turning it into a list I'm just like taking my hats off to him of mm. course I still went through the second edit and went but you've cut him out again you know? <laughs> yeah. and um, yeah so anyone who was cut out and sort of uh, I felt they should have had their own chapter has been mentioned in the back so <laughs> don't want any moaning <laughs> it's so important to obviously like keep your voice though isn't it because like obviously it is your story and stuff mm. but I think people know subconsciously if it's not if it's not authentic from you do you know what I mean I think yeah. that's like so delicate and so it has to be real doesn't it in order for people to to get on board with it exactly like so the, the only inaccuracies in it are ones where I just got the, the details slightly wrong geographically and stuff <laughs> <laughs> so um, and I don't think there's any typos in there like I found loads when I was doing the audio book that I didn't read like normally and stuff but uh, yeah it's quite a lot I know I can go on but uh, <laughs> yeah, you surprise yourself <laughs> quite a lot yeah <laughs> well I guess going back again just focusing on the editing and on things that have been taken out I guess it's a strange one because if I you know it, you, you've had things happen to you in America and things have happened yeah. and it, if you'd maybe told me or you read it in a book you could just maybe skim over it or think oh yeah Rob but for you that could have been like so significant or it mm-hmm. gives you such a warm fuzzy feeling when you would even think back to it Yeah. but yeah when an editor's looking at it you might go oh yeah you, you stopped off and spoke to Jane okay well that's like but Jane could have been like oh mm. wow she really kept me going at a, at a proper low moment so yeah. I guess it's hard isn't it to, to know what you well, I can I can tell you my favourite stories from like the from the book that didn't get in, you know. So it goes to like an exclusive, <laughs> and um, so there's this town in Tennessee called Cookville, and it just turned into being a weird hub for the whole thing. So it's where we stopped and left the RV when um, when Nadine had to go back home, and I got the, the Greyhound back to Jackson, Tennessee, and you get out of Jackson, Tennessee, and it's like a Bruce Springsteen video, you know, the proper Greyhound thing and stuff. So I ran to Cookville. And the people there were so friendly. Uh, before Nadine went back, I met someone who's like one of the most important people on, on the run to me, a lady called Tyvee, who is uh, one of my best mates, proper future mum-in-law. And uh, she became a super fan. They drove from uh, Atlanta, Georgia to Cookville, which is about like a four hour drive, uh, to just come to dinner before Nadine went back. And they were gonna bring me like all my camping stuff that I'd had posted to their sleeping mat stove and everything like that, take us out for dinner get there we say our goodbyes and just like can I just get the um, the stuff out of your car and she just went left it on the dining room table oh. drives back to Atlanta turns around straight back wow. does that and so um, wow. that's where we met Tyvee but then when I ran back through Cookville uh, a local cycle shop owner said um, you know like where are you staying tonight and I said well I've got all this stuff that I thought I needed when I was solo and I don't and the stuff that I do need and it's in the RV 
So we went to this storage yard and like sort of he drove over the car and the gates went and so I went in, sorted my kit out and um he said like give us a bell when you when you like sort of one picking up and there was a load of fast food places over the road and stuff and I just went, well, I'm gonna sort myself out there, go over and the gate doesn't open, there's a belting down with rain, proper like sort of, you know, Tennessee like sort of a monsoon and I couldn't get out of this thing. So I ended up saying to Jason if I can't get out, I'm legit allowed to stay in the RV overnight. So I know you come and get me and open the gate, but I want to stay here. And so I stayed in the RV, made myself a super noodles uh, sort of dinner on, on the stove because there was no power, just that we had the gas that was left over. And it was like a romantic dinner for one, but without Nadine. And then I went into the bed and like I could still smell a hair on the pillow. And I was just like, oh, this I got dead sad, obviously. No, I won't cut up on camera, I'm too hard. And, <laughs> and, um, although I bloody did in the audio book a couple of times, I'd be interested really? to see how that sounds. I've not heard it yet, you know. And um, But yeah, and so that was the thing. But just a really cute one, talk about these people who seem insignificant to the story. Like, oh, clearly neither likes the Tyvee, likes the Nadine, or even Jason, who I went back to Cookville to pick up the RV. <clears throat> He gave me some uh, Tennessee uh, running socks that I've since worn to pace John Kelly to his Pennine uh, way record attempt. And um, But I was just coming through this area and there was like a little fairly ramshackle house and uh, two little girls were playing outside as I ran past and they shouted like, what are you doing? Well, I don't, I'm really bad with ages. I reckon he must have been about six or eight and the dad was there and he came over and like sort of uh, was chatting away. It was just like, Daddy, Daddy, can we get him an apple? Can we get him an apple? So they go into the house, get an apple. They come back with a, an a unnamed energy drink and then uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and give it to me and sort of, and like, you know, they say, is there anything else you want? And um, so I was just like, oh, thanks very much. Get on my way and ended up getting to the RV, but, you know, getting drenched. And the fella that night messaged me and just said, oh, my daughters are really worried because they were just like, he's got an umbrella, don't he, daddy? He's got an umbrella, <laughs> you know? And um, it's just like, that was just such a lovely little act of kindness. And like when I was in there, I was saying, I was saying to the publishers, oh, please, can this go in? You know, but they said, oh, don't worry, you can release little things like that, you know, yeah, sort of on yeah. the outside of it. And then... Um, you know, sort of like for paperback editions, reprints and stuff like that, yeah. we might whack it in. So and I get to tell people like you, yeah. Jesus, so yeah. And, um, I know you're saying the five books thing, but I genuinely do think you've got five books in you. Do you know what I mean? It's <laughs> ridiculous, yeah. like tell the stories. I, I just think as well, like you know, the the thing again, the whole America thing is just fascinating, isn't it? Mm. Because America's so, how big it is. You know, it's, yeah. I think we spoke a little bit last time about you know the politics of the country and just the history of how it's you know can be divided at times. It, it's fascinating and to the to think you've ran so many miles across it in in every like sort it's of background mad. you know sort of rich or poor red or blue you know sort of all all races you know sort of it's mm. been it's been great you know and I know that obviously America's got its big divisions but I think you've got our optimism that mm. they can heal them you mm. know just be from the, the from the people that I met then and people just saying oh yeah, but of course they're going to be nice to you because you're running across America, you know, sort of, and you're the sort of a middle-class white male and stuff like that. But I didn't get any different reaction from anybody, you know. In mm. fact, actually, quite a lot of the, the worst reactions I got so there was just when I was in the cities and people weren't bothered about it. So that kindness is out there. Mm. And you've just got to harness that, you know, and sort of people just say, oh, but you won't be able to. Well, they're obviously not the people to do the job, are they? You know, so <laughs> yeah. it's the people who say, yeah, we can, mm. you know. Do you feel like a proper real connection to America now because you've spent so much of your... Yeah. You know, like, not your life, but you know what I mean? You've spent so many really important times in your life in America. Massively. Like, sort of, and, and the thing is, like, people just say, oh, would you move out there? And, like, sort of... I, I potentially could, but I couldn't pick a place. Like, sort of, you know, mm. you talk about the big cities, like, sort of, you know, like Nashville, Chicago, Austin, you know, sort of uh, Portland, you know, sort of all be up there. But then all these, like, little small towns that you'll never, like, hear of in your life, like Wallace, Idaho. It was the film in Dante's Peak. Mm. And um, the, the mayor there declared it to be the centre of the universe. That's in the book, that, like, the whole <laughs> quote. Is, so he just said, well, why not? Somewhere's got to be. And then, like, sort of all these little places, like, in Oklahoma and random towns in Vermont, you know, like, finding breweries. If I moved to America, I would have to be a nomad. So I think it's probably, sort of, if B, like, ever goes to university and moves away or anything like that, 
you know, or if Nadine kicks me out, yeah. which is what you're like. Yeah. Um, you know, sort of, would I just go and roam that way? Yeah, but uh, get yourself a Harley Davidson and just get across. Oh, a little little camper van for me, man. Yeah, <laughs> like so I might sort of ship an old Volkswagen out there, you know, because I'd say you can get one out there, but we've shipped all their old Volkswagens over here because we we want them more than you. So yeah. They're all happy, rust free in the Arizona desert, and now they're rusting away on someone's driving solid. <laughs> <laughs> so the book itself my where does it kind of start does it start with you know you just having this idea to, to run across it where, where does it, the book begin it starts with something I need very badly a haircut <laughs> that's the thing you, f- you forget that this is all on video doesn't it and look at the state of me barn but I've heard curtains are coming back so it's uh, <laughs> you're uh, it's, a trend set of me yeah exactly I know I saw the f- uh, photo of Liam Gallagher's new uh, album covering the amount of curtains on there it's yeah. great it took me back to 90 yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I got a I got a haircut in a Flukes barber shop in. A, oh, so the book starts out, out in the states. It's it's exactly, like UK. Yeah. yeah, like so it's a little bit of a scene set there, and then dives back to the motivations and stuff, and then then on we go. <laughs> It's amazing, and obviously, then it ends with the with the kind of how, how the movie ends. Yeah, exactly, in the same place. But then it also uh, it actually does end with a nice little story similar to the one I told you about those little girls, you know, sort of um, because I always sort of felt uncomfortable with the focus being on me on the run. I I knew I had to promote it because otherwise the charities weren't going to get anything. But I quite like to think of the run as as the thing, and I was basically just sort of a part of it you know so like Nadine doing all the driving my other mates who came out and helped out so much like sort of Olivia and Rick and Ben um, and then all the people I met on the road like sort of yeah that might have had more of a speaking part than most people but it was you know the run was the thing and um, so I wanted to focus back on them people at the end and, and on America mm. And so then, basically, you probably find my what a political scholars would say was a really embarrassing and overly optimistic view of the future. But uh, <laughs> as I said, they're not the people mm. for the job. <laughs> not wrong with that. No, and I think that you're going with the experience you've had and not knowing you a little bit now, mate. I think the kind of infectious kind of attitude towards people in life and life and that what you've just said then, there are, there are good people out there, kind people out there. You know, I wouldn't expect you to have any other view of the world given what you've done. I am now announcing my run for presidency in the next uh, term. I've just, I've just got to uh, try and see if I can see if I've got any uh, American birth relatives. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> do you know, um, like, not to bring a massive down on what you do, but is there any moment where you, where you were like, you know, you felt done? Do you know what I mean? You're just like every morning. I know, yeah. <laughs> I know you've touched yeah. on this on previous podcasts, but just so interesting yeah. because you are a very optimistic person. You know, you, you are infectious with your personality, but. Just is there any times where you're just like you know what? Um, the, the one thing is though, like, it's it's not a show, mm. the, the, the thingy. But I am much more outwardly infectious than I am inwardly. You know, sort of uh, like sort of I do have to keep myself sort of on the level. Like sort of I go, you know, sort of. I'm not going to say I go as low as everyone, but I definitely go low. Mm-hmm. And you know where I am in the big spectrum of things, I don't know. But I have to tell myself that you know things are going to get better. Like sort of, I've been sort of like work had been bumming me out recently, but the last sort of few days, I've just been like, God, I'm having a great time here. Everyone I work with sounds, you know, sort of, and and then you just think these little things are fluctuations. And mm-hmm. if I always tell myself that even if you're on a downer, there will be an up, and it will happen soon. And then that makes your downer a little bit less bad as well. But yeah, like every morning I would struggle because I'd be like, sort of, I can't run 40 miles. So you just go, well, I did it yesterday. And what am I going to do? Sit in this motel until I wake up tomorrow morning and say, I can't run 40 mm. miles. You may as well just get on the ground, you know, and off you go. But um, there were a few, like, apocalyptic things where I just thought, oh, this is it. You know, like 400 miles in in Houston when, like, I had my first major injury and I ended up, like, sobbing in the arms of this gas station cashier, you know, like, thinking it's all over. Um, like sort of running out of money on a number of occasions mm. um, you know so it would have been nice to have had the gold plated RV and sort of you know sort of um, being able to eat in all the nice restaurants and stuff rather than like scrimp and buy on microwave burritos but <laughs> it would have been a different story and to yeah. be honest I might have come out of that if I'd have been sponsored maybe I'd have been a worse person for it because like sort of if I was going through like sort of these deprived areas but wasn't feeling any sense of deprivation, would I just be like, so I can't wait mm. to get back to my comfortable holiday mm. in or whatever it is like that, you know? 
Um, would you it have been easier to quit, I guess, as well? You know, yeah. you know, you've got this lovely little RV, yeah. and, you know, exactly. you know duck feather pillow. Yeah, stuff. and like, so we would have took a lot longer because there were times like stuff where, uh, like my longest day, which is like, um, I think it was about 63 miles, I was desperate to get to this town for a cafe. And um, as I, you know, I could see the lights on the horizon, but it was such a, like, it was in like sort of Colorado, which obviously you think super mountainous, but only in that little bit, you know, towards the, uh, towards the east of it, super, super flat. I could see these lights for miles away. And like an hour later, they were no closer. And I got to this place about a like quarter to nine at night. Um, sh- it's going to be shut in it, but I just think, I'm just going to go and look at it just to see if it's sort of uh, open. Turned out it wasn't just a cafe, it was a bar as well. <laughs> and I just sort of walked in there and then this dude, um, like a big sort of, he was an oil truck driver called Jeff Stelter, just went, oh my sweet Lord Jesus, Boris Gump's here. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't know I was coming, but it was just blatantly obvious, you know, like sort of whether he knew I was actually doing that or whether he was just taking a mick, which I suspect. <laughs> and um, he, he decided, he said, what's your name? And I said, Rob. And he went, hey, everybody, Rob's here. I was Rob <laughs> the rest of the night. And, um, so, yeah, again, example of kindness. I didn't buy any beers there and I had quite a few. Then uh, we go back to his and his like sort of uh, like housemate sort of trailer and um, like a couple more beers there. They offered me some prairie oysters, which as we all know are sort of uh, like bull's testicles, and uh, I didn't I didn't have any of them. And um, the next day, like he sent me off with a big tub of protein powder and like sort of uh, the lads give me about like sort of fifty bucks as well, you know and. Wow. And it's just just insane. But like, so yeah, those sort of moments, running out of money was rubbish. And then the biggie really was, I had to come home in um, in December. It's one of these things now. We're going all the spoilers away from the book, but everybody knows it anyway. The book, it's still worth reading. And um, I was really depressed when I came home at Christmas because I had to renew my visa. I was a bit injured. Well, I was a lot injured, uh, like loads of pelvic problems. And my mate said to me, he said, actually, the lad who took the photo on the front of the uh, book, he said, um, he said, you don't want to go back out, do you? And I said, no. And he said, like, why? And I said, well, I was referring to all these things, like, you know, the injuries, the money. But I realised it was just because I knew Nadine wouldn't be able to be out there at the end. And of course, I've run across the country four times here, sort of, my missus is, like, pregnant now, you mm-hmm. know, sort of, and I'm going to be out there. I said, Forrest wouldn't have gone on you know so if you'd known that he'd have, he'd have finished that leg so I should have finished in San Francisco we should have gone to San Francisco we should have knocked it on the head and I said that to Nadine and she's just like no way it was like a proper you know sort of like Mickey and Rocky moment he's just going to go like you finish this <laughs> you know and uh, you finish this and you've got like that story to tell forever and mm-hmm. I obviously asked the same question when I went back in December and she said the same but it, I was still really depressed and then Missing my flight and having to stay on JFK airport floor um, didn't really help. Next day, I aggravated my injuries because it snowed for the first time in uh, Beaufort, South Carolina, for the first time in 28 years. It was actually the day that Van Dyke made his debut for uh, Liverpool. And I was listening it's to Everton. it. Yeah, I was listening to it just, just after I'd come back from the Fourth Ocean, uh, which is where they sit filmed all the Vietnam scenes of Forrest Gump. And uh, I obviously wildly celebrated that goal apologies to all Evertonians uh, you got your revenge I guess um, yeah. and I, um, I I slipped really badly and did my groin in and stuff and so super depressed and it was only once I got across Alabama and I just thought why don't I just finish a bit early at a, at a particular landmark go back and get Nadine and come and do the final sort of few hundred miles and mm. stuff like that because I knew sort of uh, like I had enough time to um, to finish the run before B was born uh, and go back and it would have been great but I'd have been like sort of telling all my amazing stories of the road the finish that Nadine wasn't there at and she'd be telling me how much she'd been struggling painting nurseries and yeah. stuff and so um, I didn't do it just to get the quiet life. I did it because that was the only thing that would have psychologically got me through the end of the run. And mm. as soon as I just thought and, and spoke to her and said, would you come back out? It was like the cloud just went... Mm. You know, it's, sometimes the, 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 the solutions are so simple, but you just can't see them or you just don't think they're possible. Mm. You're just like, why am I sad? Because she can't be there at the end. Solution, make her be there at the end. Dead mm. easy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's such an important lesson. And it? Like, overthinking is sometimes the worst thing, isn't it? And, mm. you know, when you do look at 
problems for what they are. Yeah. Some a lot of the time there's a solution right in front of your face. Do you know oh, what yeah. I mean? Hundred percent. It's just your own mind will just take it, you know, somewhere it doesn't need to be and create this big yeah sort of whirlwind. It's I think what's going to be so exciting for me reading this story is there's obviously some really big poignant moments like that. You know, getting um, your missus to come out there and stuff. But weirdly, I'm looking forward to just like the little random ones as well. Do you know what I mean? Like I remember not nowhere near compared to you, but I, I remember I drove once from um, from uh, Los Angeles to Vegas. We we hired a car to do it. I think it was like four hours or something. And we stopped off at a little motel in the middle of nowhere. And it was just like a, I mean, it'd just be the equivalent of going down the M6 and stopping at a petrol <laughs> yeah, station. I know. But because it was like in America, and I was like, wow, mm. this is cool. And looking back now, not an exciting happened, but it was just yeah. while wow, we're doing this. Being there is exciting. Just yeah. Being, yeah, exactly. But you've you've got that kind of story mm. times a million because you were running it, and you, you know, sometimes you were on your own, you were meeting new people. You, I just cannot wait to hear those stories just as much as yeah. the kind of really big, you know. Well, that was my favourite thing because I ran a huge part of Route sixty six, and most of it has been replaced now by the I forty, the interstate. So it's a bit like, say, for example. I don't know, you had the Pennine Way and then somebody just said, oh, we're going to put the M12 down the middle of that, you know, and so you'd find little sections of the Pennine Way you could walk on and then you'd be by mm. the M12 as you were going on. So I did all this, but you'd see all these towns that were like sort of, you know, just like slowly decaying. But that's the thing with America is like you get, it's it's, it's such a place of flux because it's so big, you know, it's where the jobs are. And like, you know, we'll we'll see cities have a rough time here. You know, so, you know, we all know about like, the, the, the rough time Liverpool's come through, mm. but it's still not on the scale that these go through. You know, even their big cities like Detroit, you know, sort of they're off the chain mm. sort of levels of like sort of decay in Gary, <laughs> Indiana. Do you forget just how big America is? Oh. It's fucking mm. huge, isn't it? Well, like, I flew across it sort of on the way back because, um, the, the second time I had to renew my visa was in Chicago and like the city I'm Chicago Bears fan bowls and stuff mm. so it was incredible for me to be there and so I had to go back home and I flew and it connected in New York and I was going over and as I was going over upstate New York there's this area called the Finger Lakes and it literally is just like as if your hand was like that and it's like a glacier thing and I could see these just like a run there and then I saw like we flew by uh, so like Lake Michigan and I saw oh, it was Lake Erie sorry and um, there was a pier at Dunkirk where I'd had me fish and chips and I, I saw that and I was just like and I was then just thinking <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was thinking, I've got to, got to go from Chicago <laughs> up to Montana, down to San Francisco, and then still, I'm probably double that before I'm at the end. And um, yeah, I think long enough for the place. Just, just like that, sorry, George, on, on that. I love the way in the book, there's like, you know, a map of like literally, I just think that is just. We're talking about how big America is today, what you've yeah. managed. Just you know, it like, looks like it looks like a really like nice five K course there, do you know? The reality of it. Yeah. It's like fifteen thousand yeah, miles. Yeah, yeah. But it's just so big a scale, but yeah. I think that's the thing with America, isn't it? Until I mean I went and travelled a little bit of it playing football, but um you don't realise the scale of it until you your feet are on the ground and you're like, yeah. Oh my god, and this that, is like that's a- why everybody's gotta do an American road trip at some point in their mm. time, whether it's in a car, a Harley, a, you mm. know, sort of a push bike, you know, walking or running, like I do maintain that like sort of, you know, anybody as long as they've not got like sort of like a medical reason can sort self propel somehow across America. Mm. And the speed that you go across, like people just say, Oh, was Kansas not dead boring in Nebraska? Like, no, because when you're only going six mile an hour, you know, mm. you see these little things like a sort of like the, a tin, I think it was like a tin off the top of spam. Um, like, so, or beans, it probably was, like just at the side of the road, and on the inside of the tin, it was just like, we've got to get out of this place. And like, nobody <laughs> yeah. sees that in the car, but you're yeah. going along, you just that's the best thing I'll see all day. <laughs> Brilliant, mate. No, I listen, mate. Thank you, thank you so much for bringing one in. I cannot wait to read it. So, on the note of the book, go and buy it. Tasty. I know it's everyone enjoys it. Stones, your WH Smith, and of course, we're talking about little towns and stuff like that. That goes to all like your independent things. So, if you do your road trip, stay in independent motels, and if you buy books, if you've got local indie bookshops, support them as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. Lovely. Mate, you've also then, as well as the book, so you've got the audio. When's that going to be released? Thursday same as well? Day, yeah, same, same day, day yeah. I, 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 like, so I, I don't sort of personally do the audio books myself, like sort of, uh, I don't know. I th- What's going to benefit you most people? What, buy them from you directly, independent shops? What's going to... Uh, 
guys, I've not even thought about it, man. I just want people to enjoy it. <laughs> says a lot about you, to be fair. It's such a nice... I'm like that, like, come on, let's make <laughs> you the most money, Rob. Yeah. Just like, as long as people so, like we'll, it. We'll have a chat afterwards. Yeah. 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 People just send an anonymous check through the post. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, anyway, yeah. <laughs> Go and support Rob and buy the book, Become yeah. a Forest. So as well as that, mate, you also just dropped in, just as you do, you know, yeah, a little a challenge. McDonald's coffee, yeah. 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 <laughs> a little challenge, what we'll, what we'll be getting done this weekend. So we can maybe put this clip out um, on Saturday. Sounds the good. The full episode will be out Monday, but yeah. go on then. So if this is going out to people on Saturday, just give a little run through about what your plan is. Oh, George, sure. you mention the fact that it just looks like a little 5K <laughs> course. Well, for the start, there's no little 5K. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're all, they're all inside each other. It just depends on how much you put into them. So we all love park runs, you know, um, fantastic free 5K races happening probably within three miles of wherever you live all over the country and happens every Saturday at 9am. So I've done a fair few. Um, normally go Croxteth Hall one. But um, on Saturday, I'm going to try and do a different park run every hour until just like Forest, I say I'm pretty tired. Oh, in like agonising pain I think I'll go home now and um, so I'm going to start in Blackpool at 6 in the morning then I'm going to go Lytham Preston um, Southport Crosby uh, Kew Woods um, Princess Park Crocky Park St Ellen's Sutton Manor going to go Warrington oh I'm sorry if I missed any out but I'm going to do all those ones there head on to uh, towards Manchester um, and then I'd probably get to about Glossop by about five in the morning, so it's a, an excellent excuse to stay up for the uh, Tyson Fury fight. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Mate, and, if you're and, still awake by that well, time, exactly. I may as well treat myself. Hey, and, um, this is, um, in some ways, I think this is a bit more extraordinary than this run because I think one thing which I found, and I was telling people, because I'm, I think, your biggest fan, I tell everyone about you, <laughs> when I'm telling people about what you do, like we've just said, then America's so big, it's hard to grasp. You go, what, you ran across America? Yeah, well, like about four and a half mm. times or something. Yeah, well, I've, you, 15 and a half thousand miles it doesn't seem real yeah most people have ran 5k no 5k so to think you're gonna just keep doing them and doing them and doing them in some ways it's almost becomes more it's because you've sorry it's because yeah. you've like as you say a lot of us have ran 5k before and you get to an end of 5k and you are tired you know what I mean it's, I think it's because people can now relate to what you're doing yeah, like that's how, it, that's you, yeah. how are late. you gonna do that, you know. What I mean? well, it's, it's going to be like an evil interval session. And the thing is, like, sort of, um, I'm sort of reasonably fit at the moment, but not in any serious shape. Uh, I'm hoping the brakes help. I'm hoping the brakes don't stiffen me up. Uh, I think one of the hardest bits is going to be the time, and I'm lucky enough, uh, especially sort of on the north, like sort of western coast, to have like loads of people who've stepped up and are going to support us now. It's getting a bit thin on the ground in Manchester, which is fair enough because they're going to be there in the early hours of the morning and um, and it's the Manchester Marathon the next day. So from Warrington, uh, I'm basically driving to Warrington, get the train up to Blackpool and then in Warrington, I'm going to be self-supporting. Uh, so I'm going to be driving around. Don't worry, I'm not going to drive if I'm tired. But I'm figuring because I'm only going to be doing 10 minutes driving at a time, it'll be straight after a run. You know, I'll probably be all right. I'm going to have a couple of hours kip in Glossop I say this. I'm going to have a couple of hours. Even if I get as far as Glossop, like I'll be happy if I get at least to uh, like Croxteth Park, and it won't be far from my house. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, Mate, and then is... going to go across the Pennines. I can't get me head around this already. So, <laughs> what, how fast do you want to do these five Ks? And do you think? I'm hoping to start off because obviously I don't know what conditions are going to be like on some of these ones underfoot. And if I if I get to the Sheffield ones, uh, like apparently Cheadle Hume's just a muddy field, so that's going to be slow. And the Sheffield ones are going to be hilly. Uh, I'm open to do about 25 minutes on average, but I'm thinking they're probably going to start lurching towards the 30 and stuff. And, you know, sort of, I'd be worried if I go much beyond the 30 because that would probably mean I'm getting pretty delirious, mm. you know. And so uh, the Manchester ones are going to be the real backbreaker mm. because I'm probably going to have to be navigating myself there as well, not knowing what the course is. So my little solution for the plan is um, I'm going to get like a dry white marker get the park run map on my phone, draw it around it. It's always been thought out this, you know. Uh, draw, yeah, not thought what I'm going to eat or whether yeah, I'm going to toilet. Yeah, I just thought about this. Um, draw it around the map, then go onto Google Maps and then my little blue dot should go around where I've drawn. 
I'd have a backup as well, mate, just in case. Do you know the thing? That we, <laughs> I, I would, phone battery runs out yeah. Yeah. in a park instead of <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. two in the morning, you know. I'd have to have, like, to do that, I, I couldn't do it anyway, but to, to, I'd have to have, like, a team of, like, 20 people, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Someone to drive, someone to feed yeah. me, someone to give me a bit of water. But you're like, yeah, well, I'm going to finish, going to jump in my car, get to the but next one. The thing is, like, so with the book, there was a known finish line. I never dreamt I would, mm. I would get to it. And there was sub-finish lines as well. There were oceans, and there were even just state lines or big cities. With this one, there is potentially a finish line, which is, um, you know, the East Coast. But I'm, I know that the likely of, uh, finish line is just me being knackered and stopping because if I get to the East Coast and I'm not done, I'll carry on. Like, so I don't know what I'll do. I'll have to get trained to Leeds or something and do some there. But, how, uh, how long then for you do you say you take 25 minutes to do the 5K? How long will you be running and how long have you got until you're running again? So that would be total of 35 until the next one. And so a couple of well, so on, Hang on, on the hour? On the hour, a... on the hour, every hour. So you, you could oh be, my God. You could be running, driving and then arriving within like five, with yeah, five could, minutes could to be, go. Yeah, could be getting out. That, that is especially because a couple of park runs. One uh, has stopped, unfortunately, up by Blackpool and uh, Ormskirk's got Edgehill's Open University that day. I've had to have two of the stepping stones taken out. And so the the the, um, the Preston to Southport one and the Southport to Crosby you know, yeah the Q Woods to Crosby one are going to be a uh, going to be pretty rough. That's literally you know like bang and gone. And of course there's going to be a little bit of running on some of these to the start. So I'm oh not going to. Oh my god, uh, you are a madman. <laughs> if I'm ahead of time, just because some people might be nice enough to turn up. I'm not going to start early. I'd start up to 10 minutes early, but I'd not be funny. You know, if you've got an appointment, you generally arrive 10 minutes early, don't you? So I'm going to say to people, be there 10 minutes early and I'll go. If I'm there at 10 to 9, I'll go. Uh, oh, but I'm me. just hoping if we get there at 20 past 9, people stick around. <laughs> How did this come about? Like, was this you or did someone... Like... I, just want, I just wanted to do something that would... Um, you know, it's just like with that run, isn't it? You know, sort of capture the imagination and stuff. And so um, I, I originally sort of wasn't going to do it for like you know as in raising money for charity because like uh, recently I did the run to Glastonbury um, mm. for Oxfam and um, and so I, I didn't want to be that guy who's always asking for stuff you know but I've just said like my two charities for the run World Wildlife Fund and Peace Direct I just want people to go on the website check them out and if you want to become a member of any of them you know that's much better than giving them a, like a random sort mm. of 10 or 50 quid and stuff I might put a link out at the end. I might just do a little just giving page and just have it up for a week and then just saying, you know, mm. sorry, I only, only did three park runs before I gave up. But <laughs> 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 like, so you do better. <laughs> right, so how many? I, again, I, I, I just think it's absolutely bonkers what you're doing, but how many do you think you can run? How many hours do you think you can go for? Um... I reckon, like, sort of, it, it depends where we start drawing the lines and stuff like that. I want to do 24 without stopping. That's sort of, if I, if I don't get injured and if I haven't massively underestimated the faff of getting in between places, which has been suggested to me, <laughs> then I'd like to do 24. And I was sort so of. So that's kidding. 120k? Yeah. I mean, the most I've done in a day and stuff. But then again, you know, sort of in 20, like recently someone's just broken the world 24 hour record and I think he did about 160 miles. So to be honest, you know, sort of, um, I should be running between these park runs. Do you know when I'm you see, fraud. do you know when you, <laughs> yeah, uh, do you know when you see stuff like that? Does that light a fire or anything for you? Like, you know, when you see, not saying like, you want to be the it's best of that book. It sort of does, but it, it, because it's so niche you know, like, sort of, you, I don't think you, with with ultra running, you don't know if you can be really good until you've actually done that. Mm. Now, that probably takes years and years of training. Now, I know that, like, sort of, and this isn't big edit, this is just the fact that, you know, I've competed in, like, sort of, you know, well, we talked about the Mouth of Day Saab before, and, like, when I did that, like, I was, like, top Britain in that, but I still wasn't in danger of winning it so you know I'm good but where could I get to if I trained loads and we've all got these things mm -hmm. what you know what would I be if this sliding doors moment hadn't happened where would I be if I put more graft in but then it's all weighing up about whether that graft's worth it you know and does it n never mind like for you but also the people around you you know mm -hmm. like sort of um like I would love it if I could get in from work every day and sort of say to Nads, like sort of, I'm just going out for two hours. Uh, I want something good for dinner. Uh, can you put the baby to bed? <laughs> and uh, I'll be up again in the morning. Can you take it to nursery? But you know, sort of, 
that's not going to work in the long run. So it's, you know, I, I've got um, a lot of respect for the people who get up at like five in the morning to do the training runs because I can't do that. Yeah. You know, so I, I was originally going to start these park runs at five o'clock and because I found out that one had cancelled, instead of just going, okay, then I'll put another one and it's just like, now nah, we'll move the Blackpool one an hour later. <laughs> <laughs> the Blackpool guys are made up with that as well. Yeah. So, uh, so have you got on your how is best for people to kind of find out so maybe so, if they want to jump in on the hour yeah, you know? um, so I've got the the complete list of runs is fairly near the top of my Twitter feed at the moment and it'll be on the Facebook one as well on the day like sort of um, I always try to reply to every message I get on social media but for just the sake of this one I'm going to be like sort of pretty much a hermit on this the only thing I'm going to be posting is like uh, Crosby ETA 1110 you know, and stuff, and then people can cross-reference that with the photo and goes, oh, he's 10 minutes down, you know, sort of, and then see whether they want to I was going to ask, that. what time then are you on Crosby? Do you know off the top of your head on Saturday? Crosby is 11. 11 yeah. o'clock? Yeah. I think I'm going to get down to that then. Mm-hmm. Get down, George. Yeah, let's do it. Well, the, the more people I've got, I just, I'm desperate for people to be on the courses because the navigating is definitely going to be a faff, you know, and stuff, and I think sort of a... Uh, if you guys are doing Crosby, I might have almost a complete line all the way through to Warrington now, which would be great, you know. And yeah. um, then it's just literally wacky races through Manchester. <laughs> hey, you are absolutely. Do you know when you say that? Like how I feel like we should, you know, come in and, and help you out. It, it sort of feels like you know we'll stop and be like, oh, you know, blowing a bit, and then you're like, see you later, lads. I'm off to the next one. Yeah. It just like <laughs> I know I said before, it's relatable, but it also still doesn't feel mm. like real well, or. That would be the argument grab. for me, yeah. just saying, see you later, on to the next one, because, like... Can't one of the stop reasons, and talk, I guess, can yeah. you? You've just got to be off. Well, no, like, I've always thought that that run, the, the Forest run, was possible. If I had, like, unlimited money and I was American and I didn't have to do my visa, I definitely could have done that in a year. But I do th- sort of think that, you know, the pressure to have done it on a time limit would have made me stop talking to people on the way because mm. I'd be like, I want to do this here. Mm. And that's why, you know, sometimes these like sort of you know vague goals like even though I've got a very strict time schedule on this one there's no finish line so it doesn't matter to be honest you know if I'm literally in bits in Manchester at two in the morning I'm not going to a put anyone else's sort of life at risk with me driving I'll sleep and I'll just say listen these five or six park runs unfortunately I've had to cut uh, I'll have a proper sleep I'll go there but there's no way without injury I'm not going to do them on the way back you know and so there's not that I'm not going to miss them out and um, it was like on the run I did Boston Marathon actually raced the marathon and um, I was hoping to run to the finish line but I tore my quad in Memphis uh, walking in Memphis yeah great bit of irony there and um, I couldn't quite make it but I got a lift to the start line and I even though if I hadn't got injured, I could have made it on time. I'd have been going through all these amazing cities, but we're not like I wouldn't have gone and visited like the John Lennon Memorial or anything like that. I'd have been like, what? I wouldn't have even gone through Manhattan. I'd have been like, okay, right, let's just skip that, go straight mm. up the coast of New York. So, like, I reckon most things in life are better if you can cut about twenty percent of stuff out. The problem is, is I just keep adding twenty percent. Who'll be with you? Is it literally just going to be you, or have you got like people going to be? So a lot of the local event directors, um, like sort of, are going to be like showing up to the individual uh, individual ones. But I mentioned sort of like sort of uh, Chris before from Crocs at All, uh, Hair Carol St Helens is race director, and a fella called Gary Jones are going to be supporting me on a huge amount like that. Gary's coming up to Preston; he's the lifesaver because he's going to get me from Preston down to uh, like the queue in Southport and everything like that. And um, it'll be handy there, but like sort of the rest of it is just literally going to be a cool box and some clothes in the back of my car in Warrington. The Sheffield lot is dead excited about it. Right? <laughs> uh, so the Sheffield Telegraph called me up yesterday, which is really worrying because it's so far into the run and I'm just like rocking away, going, I might not get that far. <laughs> and um, they've even like lined up a like an electric trike to take me from the first Sheffield one to the second one and secretly I'm thinking oh man I was hoping someone was coming with a really big like camper van that could just sleep in the back but they were uh, they were dead excited about it and I just thought I'm not going to be miserable about it and go like sort of oh no, no I want a car this really <laughs> is just you can stuff it you know and so and it's going to be a nice nice day so um, are you um, 
that you're feeling guilty at the fact that you'll be pissed as a far come nine o'clock Saturday night and Rob will still be running. <laughs> no, I do, do you know what I did think about that, but yeah. that's what separates us from. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? At the moment. Yeah, yeah. At the moment. Yeah. Me and George will be at the boxing yeah. and um, yeah, you'll be running through the night. Of course, because it's not just the Tyson fight. This yeah, year, Liam Smith and Andy yeah. Fowler are fighting in the echo. It'll be brilliant. To be fair, George, you've not... Um, you set yourself a running goal, haven't you? Yeah, so I want to run a half marathon in December. Superb, which so, one? Uh, just in the uh, in the pool, yeah, in two race course, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. So basically, I I did sport for a long time. Yeah. Stopped doing sport. Felt in a bit of a rut, really. Yeah. Not not mentally or nothing like that. Do you know, we're just when you just sit on your couch, you think I've got to do something. Spoke to Andy, said, look, I've got out on a run, did a couple of five k's. I don't feel as bad as I thought I did. Yeah. Can you get me something together, like a little plan? I'm going to do the half marathon in December. Have you done it? But... You're not going to go with the fences, are you? <laughs> no, no, yeah. <laughs> I'm only over hurdles, so. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I'll be, I mean, super proud if I can, if I can do it. You know what I mean? So. Oh, I've yeah. got no, no uh, doubts that you will. Man, <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. But I said I'm going to, um, going to have a beer this weekend, and then I'm going to cut the beer out until I've done it. And all I keep thinking about is that beer once I've done. Yeah. You're yeah. a cold beer in December. Yeah, Christmas yeah. beers, yeah. I don't know yeah. where my beer's going to be on Saturday. Or so. I hope it's not on Saturday. I don't want a beer on Saturday because uh, that one will be tinged with sadness. But if I have a beer at any point on Sunday and I'm not in my own house, I will be happy because that will mean I'll at least... Uh, the, the, the sort of the goal now after the Sheffield lads have shown their enthusiasm, I think the six or seven in that area, if I can get to 30... I'll be happy, but that's weird. it's it's a risk when you set yourself an intermediate goal, isn't it? Like a place where you can mm. bug out, yeah. you know, sort of being just kind of. Can't think I've got it, you know. It's yeah. Mm. If you know where the back door is, you'll always use it, won't you? Yeah, <laughs> it's just, so that's yeah. why I'll need loads of people on the on the sort of the web to be sort of saying, "Come on." Have you got mm. many people at Crosby then? Have you spoke to people on at Crosby? Yeah? Uh, no, there? I'm not. Yeah, oh. yeah. So if you want to put a word in, yeah. yeah, man, we'll get it out all over the socials. Yeah. <laughs> Man, just... when, it co- when, it, when the whole thing comes out on Monday everyone just goes oh I didn't even make Crosby you know? <laughs> oh no yeah on your doorstep yeah Yeah, we can just go down the lock and key afterwards it'll be fine yeah yeah <laughs> I'll come the boxing <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> it's just mad it it's just mad what you're doing just absolutely and what I think the great thing is about the book again and, and not only what you're doing this weekend is it's just it's funny you know no doubt the story should be brilliant in there but I think it just gives people, like you said, but you, George, mm-hmm. even just thinking a bit, oh, I need to do something. It mm-hmm. gives people a bit of a lift to think, mm-hmm. you know, it's running. What do you need? You need to put your trainers on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's the, it. the hardest thing, like, and I've done it myself, I've done a couple now, it's just getting out though, isn't it? Once you, yeah. once you, once you take the first four or five steps, once you go, and then you go, and it's just, it's that mental fight, isn't I it? I love running like, by eight planning moments. Yeah, you know, yeah. so then, um, uh, this one's quite exciting. Yeah, I should probably get down to the shops in a bit and start buying some... Uh, Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy myself a twelve pack of Krispy Kreme or, or get down to Sayers or something like that, you know. And there's gonna be a like a donut every hour. I think in Manchester, that's gonna be what I get through every time I do a park run. I can have a donut in there. You know what else I love about you though? You're running. Like, there's, there's, like you were saying before, well, you had like a beer here and there. This is this wasn't like a you know super kind of no no one speak to me. No one yeah. I can't eat nothing yeah. but protein drinks and energy bar. It's like. May I'll have a beer what's your name okay yeah, have a beer yeah. Yeah. I think that's what makes it human doesn't it the story mm. I'd like to experience one of them one day not necessarily to break a record but to break my own record you know just to basically just go alright this is what I could do was mm. it you know mm. and stuff and so I have something that's crude you know because this like so the lockdown summer's seen so many unbelievable record attempts I was lucky enough to like pace one of them and sort of uh, like see an athlete to the class of, like John Kelly sort of you know 268 miles on the Pennine way and he did it in like 59 hours you know and so um, it's just unbelievable and I'd like to do one of those one day got a, got my eye on a few little uh, little places that I could go to but uh I don't want to sort of announce them just yet in case someone else does it and makes it harder. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not to be completely ironic, but do you ever see a point in your life where you just, you know, you're not running? Oh, yeah, I set myself little things all the time. <laughs> like, just go, up, well, I'll do that, and then that's it. Yeah. You know, sort of, um, you know, sort of... Um, one thing I actually am planning on doing, I guess it does depend on the success of the book. So, actually, you know when you say, what's the best thing you could do for the book? Buy presents for everybody in your family. You can't be bothered thinking what to get them. Buy them that, especially if they've literally ever even run. And you said, oh, I thought you loved running. Um, <laughs> you know, get them that because the book comes out in America on February the 8th. And I want to go out there and I want to start at that place where I sort of finished. And I want to get to the ocean one last time. You know, sort of because the, the original dream was only ever to run across America. And even though I've completed something that was beyond my wildest dreams... 
I do have that affinity there and there's a bit of me, you know, so it's like one of these fighters coming back for one last thing, you know, I might get sort of, you know, just um, fail somewhere on the Californian highway outside Baker, but, you know, it'd be, it'd be worth going. Then, yeah, you, then you see your limit, don't you? And then you just go, well, I gave it a go. And then mm. in the year's time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back out to Baker. <laughs> <laughs> I've still got it. Yeah. Yeah. The last one will be like five k, and you'll be like, "Rob, do you really want to fly to LA for those five k that you've already run?" You don't understand, man. I love it. It's amazing, mate. Absolutely amazing. And again, I can't wait. Thank you so much for the book, mate. Is no, there anything else you want to touch upon, mate? No, oh god, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll be bounding on my run later now. Yeah, for real. Like sort of, uh, you'll have to let me know how those five k's are doing. Oh, mate, I will. I will. I mean, I'm, I'm slowly improving. I mean, not quite at your level, never will be, but slowly improving. But as I say, I just feel much better for it. Yeah, it's, well. it's crazy. And as Andy said before, you just need a pair of shoes and, you know, and actually get past them little mental blocks of, oh, just go and sit on the couch, don't go out the door. Well, one of the things yeah. that can help you get over those mental blocks is these sort of social runs. So the park mm. runs are fantastic, but also, like I so said, this Saturday, and like it's the first Saturday of every month, there's an awesome running club in town called the Michela Running Club. Mm. They meet down at Black Lodge Brewery and then they basically do a little social run about 12 o'clock and then they come back, you get to the brewery and you even get a free pint after you do the run. Oh, well. really, so, yeah? Yeah. That's George saw that free pint. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm a monk till December now, so after the weekend. <laughs> Just the last one on the book, mate, as well. What a love and don't get me wrong reading it and painting pictures in your head is, is, is great but some of the photos you've got in here mate are just unbelievable straight away just takes me back to the film when he's on yeah. the uh, you know the shrimp boat selecting 32 from the thousands that I've got yeah oh, that must have been difficult yeah I didn't even think about that yeah yeah like I, I, I did sort of have them whittled down sort of uh, the publishers they know the ones that really like popped out at you and so um, that's good in there yeah that's Fluke's Barbers right at the start <laughs> <laughs> it is mad how you've I watch Forrest Gump not, you know what was so funny it was on the uh, telly not long after we had you on the amount of people who messaged me went lad Forrest Gump's on the telly <laughs> <laughs> well it, even when it comes on now and I do watch it and it gets to the bit the seven odd minutes of the running scene you know like sort of like my heart rate just starts going up a bit like and then uh, <laughs> unreal mate <laughs> so I look for my shoes and stuff <laughs> yeah look there's even a beer drinking photo in there yeah there you go yeah a necessary pit stop <laughs> No, Rob, I know from last time I made the feedback we got, everyone just thought you were unbelievable. They thought you were crazy, inspirational. And I know, mate, the book will no doubt be a huge success, mate. Mm-hmm. No doubt. It's, and um, then just four more books to go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I, did, I, did, I don't think anybody will ever try and do this challenge as a record, but I do have my eye on running from Shawshank Prison to uh, to that place, that beach in Mexico. Oh, <laughs> really? yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. This is what you need to do. You guys could do like an on-the-road podcast. We could get That's the, the RV. We could podcast all down the way through the States. That is the do plan, not. mate. <laughs> don't tempt me. <laughs> yeah. We've got big plans for it, mate, and I think if we keep getting cool people on like yourself, maybe with inspirational stories, it'll keep, it'll keep growing, so you never know, mate. That, that RV supporting you one day, mate, will be a pod in itself. I mean, I feel quite bad if we were just in the RV with a camera <laughs> Like you were doing all the hard work. Well, oh, that, that's uh, so, I, I do enjoy. It. Like I said, Nadine sort of did all the sort of you know the driving and stuff, and you think, oh, well, I'm doing the hard work now. It's much harder yeah. to support, you know, sort of, and, uh, and probably less fun. But you know, to quote sort of a, that other film, sure, Shank, you know, it's get busy living or get busy dying in it. Absolutely, <laughs> what a film, Rob. Mate, you're an absolute legend, and make sure you give us a shout next time you're doing something crazy again. And uh, yeah, we'd love to help and support you. And go and buy Rob's book. Available on Thursday, becoming forest. Go and buy it. <laughs>